welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, Kevin of Engineering Politics and I uh, here we have a very special guest uh, brought to you by once again the fine folks at ThinkSpot. ThinkSpot is awesome. We appreciate you guys setting this up for us. Um, anyone who's not on ThinkSpot or isn't checking out what's going on over there, um, I think you're really missing out. You need to go look into it, especially into our um, current guests repertoire. He's got a lot of stuff over there as well. Um, but yeah, so Kevin, why don't you why don't you tell the folks at home, kick it off for us. Who are we talking to here, man? Who's who's this intellectual giant we have? Yes. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hicks, I believe medical doctor, right? So all these are going to be COVID related questions. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hicks is the author of Explaining Postmodernism, actually a book I have here. I think Truman and I both uh, got to read it uh, before. Yep. Excellent book. Uh, we'll hit some topics on it today, but but certainly mm -hmm. the best way to to review his work is just read the work. So coming from us, it's going to be nothing compared to, to just buying it yourself and reading it. So, uh, you know, the author of Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault. He also wrote Not, or Nietzsche and the Nazis and many other works. He's a professor of philosophy at Rockford University in Illinois, executive director of the Center of Ethics and Entrepreneurship, a senior scholar at the Atlas Society. Uh, his books and other writings have been translated into 18 different languages. He has been published in academic journals such as the Business Ethics Quarterly, uh, Teaching Philosophy and the Review of Metaphysics, as well as the Wall Street Journal and the Cato Unbound. So he's won many awards. We're happy to have him on. And, and honestly, you know, we do what we always do here, uh, you know, when, when Truman and I collaborate. We want to find solutions. We're not here just to be another, you know, two guys on, on YouTube uh, complaining about something or being reactionary to something. We want to actually propose real solutions so it actually betters yep. people's lives, helps them understand you know, not, not all about politics, even though, you know, politics is in my name, sure, but, but really culture, society, how, how we talk to each other, different worldviews, and the best way to move the ball forward in, in a manner in which we can preserve all of our rights and freedoms uh, that we've enjoyed for so long and, and rights and freedoms that we, we seem to almost be freely giving away uh, as of recently. So that's why Stephen's on. We're happy to have you. Thanks for that gracious introduction, guys. Yeah, no problem. So, so let's jump right in. Um, you know, in a lot of your interviews and in your books, you know, you, you talk a lot about how, especially like even just the most recent one with Michael Rechtenwald, which is a fantastic interview. I'd recommend people check mm -hmm. out about how contemporary like leftist thought, you know, not exclusively, you know, I always have to add that asterisk, but it seems to certainly be a monopoly on the left is, um, determined and shaped a lot by Marxian and Mar Marxism and Marxian thought, but also by Rousseau. And, and you talk a lot about Rousseau and just the massive influence that he has on not just history leading up to this moment, but also this moment mm. in and of itself. And like, it really made us think of this quote that Hayek has in the road to serfdom, uh, where he's talking about Marx's ideas that he's observing people espousing in his time in Great Britain and uh, he's talking about one particular idea of Marxism, and he says, this belief derives mainly from the Marxist doctrine of the concentration of industry, although, like so many Marxist ideas, it is now found in many circles which have received it at third or fourth hand and do not know from whence it derives. And, like, based on your interviews and your books, you know, add Rousseau into that category. Like, there are all these ideas and this philosophy that's shaped history and shaping this moment mm. – that comes from Rousseau, but there's a, these people are, you know, they're getting it not third or fourth hand, but like eighth, ninth, tenth hand yeah. and have no idea where this comes from. So why don't we start there? Like, just like who was Jean-Jacques Rousseau and like what, what was his influence on history, maybe particularly with the French Revolution, but then going forward and like, why should people care about, yeah. about Rousseau? Okay, that's, that's a big and important question. I, I, my view, to, to put it bluntly, is that Rousseau is a lot more mm. important to understanding contemporary culture than Karl Marx is. Mm. A century ago, I would have said Karl Marx. Uh, Rousseau was in eclipse, but that has that's changed a lot. Now, you start off by framing this uh, in terms of uh, the left. And uh, I think the terms left and right, we should always use them with a, with a grain of salt. Yeah, uh, that's the, you know, the kind of the 10 second soundbite level of, of politics. But as, as everybody knows, the left is a big tent. The right is a big tent. And you don't have to look very far into the side those tents to see that it's a lot of factions. And in many cases, those factions disagree with each other on some pretty fundamentalist things. So if you look on the right, 
uh, in the right tent. Many of them are deeply religious. A lot of them are atheistic, and that divide is going to uh, to, uh, uh, to have, have huge consequences for the politics. When you look inside the, the left tent, you find many of them are pro-science and pro-reason, but many of them are anti-reason, uh, you know, more emotionalist and faith-based and so on. And that has, has huge differences. So uh, uh, quickly, uh, if we take Marxism, Marxism is the version of leftist politics that dominated from the second decade of the 20th century, I would say until the fall of the Soviet Union in 1789 or so. So it had a good 70 year run or so of dominating. Now what's interesting though is people who are broadly committed to the left or socialism or some sort of communitarianism and so on, there are many, many versions of that kicking around in the 1800s and in the early 1900s but for, I think, mostly for political reasons, because of the success of the Russian Revolution, uh, and that was a small group of Marxists who took over, then suddenly everyone on the left is saying, here we have a, a major country that has adopted a kind of socialism, and we're going to rally around that particular version of socialism. And so a lot of the other contender versions of socialism just got put on the back burner and, and left to the side for a long time. Now, what uh, are some of the prominent features here is that, you know, Marxism, despite its uh, being anti-capitalist, nonetheless wants to say that capitalism is a good thing in the following sense, that it's, uh, from the Marxist perspective, it's a necessary developmental stage, that economies have to go through a capitalist stage in order to prepare the groundwork for a later dictatorship of the proletariat and, and socialism. So, you know, capitalism might have its weaknesses, but the Marxists want to say it's better than feudalism, and feudalism is better than earlier tribalism. So Marxism then is a, 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 a progressivist view of history, that we are getting better and better because as we go along, we're getting closer and closer to the dictatorship of the proletariat and then eventually socialism. Uh, also, uh, the industrialism and industrialization that's built into that marriage of capitalism and engineering and science and entrepreneurism that starts to reshape the world in the late 1700s and on into the 1800s. That industrialization is seen by Marxism as messy, as ugly, as damaging to a lot of people, but again, nonetheless, a necessary progressive stage because what industrialization does is it organizes the workers, it helps them create a collective uh, uh, consciousness, it puts the antagonisms and contradictions in contemporary society into our minds and so forth. So again, industrialization is a necessary forward stage. And the idea is that once we have organized all of society, uh, 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 capitalism is going to do all of this organization and it creates this huge amount of stuff, then and only then will we have the preconditions for socialism to come into existence. So most Marxists have this progressive uh, analysis of society, even though they want to complain about lots of things along the way. And it's going to be a high tech society that they are envisioning because it's going to be that high tech that's going to create all of the goodies that enable us to to, uh, to live the good socialist life, right, and so forth. Now, what's important then is if we start to think of someone like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was almost a century earlier than Marx. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a Frenchman, actually a Geneva, Swiss French guy, uh, uh, started doing his publishing in the late 1740s. And Marx's first big manuscript, the Communist Manifesto, was uh, 1840. So he's about a century earlier. But he is anti-progress. He is anti-industrialization. And so the version of socialism that he represents is going to be a much more back-to-nature kind of socialism. And that rather than seeing all of these developments in the modern world as in any sense progressive, as taking us toward a bright sunlit future, what uh, Rousseau argues is that things are getting worse and worse and worse. And in some ways we need to go back to an earlier stage when human beings were much more tribal rather than high tech, low tech, and in these smaller communal bands rather than these large scale industrial 
an agricultural army types of societies that uh, that uh, that uh, Marx is emphasizing. Another thing that I think is uh, is worth highlighting is that Marx and Engels called their version of socialism scientific socialism. Hmm. Now, uh, you know, what they mean by the science is 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 an interesting question, but at least in terms of their self understanding and in terms of the public relations, they are saying. We are based on an empirical analysis of the way things work. We think that we can study societies and do comparative analyses and come up with these general laws about the way societies have to work. On the basis of that, we can make predictions and these predictions are going to be testable. And so they're trying to do a kind of social science. Uh, and so they are, 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 uh, are rationalist in that per, uh, particular way. What you'll find in, uh, in Rousseau is a very outspoken, anti-rationalistic, anti-scientific epistemology or understanding of, of knowledge. Rousseau wants to argue that science makes things worse. Science is really a matter of, we have these uh, petty passions and petty uh, ego aggrandizing emotions that we want to, to justify. We all want to think that we're smarter than other people. So we come up with these abstract schemas to, to lord it over other people and to use those agendas to control other people. So he sees science as a deeply suspect enterprise. And he's much more in favor of a kind of, or what he thinks of as an, an, an authentic, passion-based, unstructured, commitment to reality rather than an analytical scientific enterprise. So what you have then is uh, they're, they're both socialist in their, in their eventual politics, but their understandings of uh, the, the way nature works, their understanding of what counts as progress or regress, what counts as uh, science being good or bad, completely different. So uh, what I think though, and this is something we can follow up a little bit more is that once Marxism was widely discredited after its experiences in the 20th century. You know, the disasters in the Soviet Union, the disasters in, uh, in communist China, you know, the great purges and the great uh, uh, genocides and democides that went on there, the disasters in Cambodia and on all sorts of other places. By the time the Soviet Union collapses, pretty much everybody says, okay, the Marxist version of socialism can't be the right version of socialism. And so, of course, some people abandon socialism and they, they become middle of the road people or they convert to liberalism or capitalism or something like that. But you'll find a lot of people who in their heart of hearts want to be socialist right? and they're not going to give that up. What they will do is say there has to be some alternative to Marxist socialism. And so they're educated, thoughtful people. And what they do is they go back in the literature to find another compelling version of socialism. And a lot of them will latch onto Rousseau. And uh, what you find is uh, starting in the 60s, 70s and 80s, a rehabilitation of a lot of these Rousseauian themes in the far left as they start to uh, rethink their Marxist commitments. Interesting. But before moving on to the next question, um, I did have the thought, like, so my understanding of Rousseau's, like, anti, like, materialist, anti-industrialization kind of stuff, anti-science in a lot of ways, was he, he had this kind of idealized version of what nature and what, and what humans were like in this state of nature yes. and how everyone, it was this really completely fabricated utopian like fictional depiction of what people were like in a, sure. a tribal setting and so I'm, I'm wondering if like there's something there that a lot of these types of ideas that are utopian almost always start from either pure abject ignorance that they kind of marry with some anecdotes and maybe even factual sure. observations sure. but their underlying premises whether it's rousseau or Marx in a lot of ways, especially with his fourth or, or fifth and sixth, you know, stages of humanity or whatever, that they are rooted in just total ignorance of, yes. of facts and reality as they are. You know, I'm, I remember there was this quote by, uh, gosh, who's the guy who came up with modern monetary theory? I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on mm. it. Um, mm. uh, Hayek and him always always went to blows, but they were at least honest with each other. Uh, I'll think of it later. But anyway, but he had, Maybe yeah, Keynes, yeah, 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 Maynard yeah. Keynes, and he he had that. Um, yeah, John Maynard Keynes, he had that quote where he, he was like, we were committed only to the certainty of our own 
ideas and no outside thing was going to convince us otherwise, you know, that there's just this kind of, like you said, this, I want this to be true and it doesn't matter what facts or reality exist out there. You know, I'm just going to, I'm going to fill in the blanks with my own idealized imagined imagination. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know. I think there's some truth to that. That's a more of a psychological interpretation of people's attraction to Rousseau or more broadly speaking to a kind of tribalism. So you'll see people will, will, will valorize, say, the American Indians as, as pure, more in touch with nature and, and, and right. so forth. Unspoiled. Yes, that's right. And then and various other kinds of tribes around the world or, or, or even back in, uh, in, in earlier times. And sometimes uh, I think it is a psychological route that people get there, that the idea in contemporary society, you know, to put it crudely from their perspective, is you are on your own and the world is very complicated and it's high tech and we're just going to throw you out into the world to be an entrepreneur and to make something of your life. Now, for some people, that's liberating. Uh, great, right? I want to be on my own and take on life's challenges. And I see all the technology and entrepreneurism as a whole bunch of opportunities for me to, uh, to, to, to develop myself. But for a lot of people, that's very scary. I don't want to be on my, on my own. I want a simpler time where there's a fewer number of choices, where the right way to live has been worked out. And there are kind of these pre-existing slots in society for me to fit into where I know what my role is and I will be accepted. And so uh, on that psychological grounds, tribalism sounds very appealing because it's all been worked out and you don't have to think in terms of a decentralized society of millions of people where everything is constantly changing. You're thinking in terms of maybe 100, 150 people and everybody knows each other and everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. And so psychologically, they can wrap their minds around that. I think another way of getting there, though, is more philosophical. And so I don't think we can always just dismiss the intellectuals who are adopting Rousseauian tribalism as, as just psychologically pining for the good old days, they will, uh, in many cases, be very informed and they can point out dysfunctionalities in contemporary society, the downsides to technology, the downside to large scale decentralized societies and so forth, and then say you know, there is a trend line that is going to result in some sort of negativity. And so what we need to do is go back in time and say, uh, before we took this fateful step, opening Pandora's box, things were a lot better and see if we can go back to before Pandora's box was, uh, was open. And that's, I think, a more sophisticated kind of, kind of tribalism. So you might say, uh, you know, we have all of these technologies. Well, sooner or later, some technology is going to come along, it's going to poison us all or blow up, uh, blow up the universe or, or destroy the environment. And we're not going to be able to control it. So let's go back to before technology took off. Mm. Or well, before we said everybody should be free to do whatever we, they want with their lives. And then we've exerted vast energies to freeing everybody from these tribes and feudal classes and old facts and sexist and racist prejudices and putting individuals out there in the world. Uh, if we think, well, that's just going to lead to a bunch of atomized individuals who don't know what they're supposed to be doing with their lives, then you'll say that's a bad trend line. We need to go back before this universal declaration of the rights of human beings to when people were born into communities and the communities shaped them and told them what to do. And we think really that's going to be better for, for most human beings. So there is a more hmm. sophisticated way of getting there. Sure. Hmm. Um, are you familiar with the, the True Believer by Eric Hoffer? Yeah, well, I, I'm familiar with it, but I'm not a scholar of it. He was an extraordinarily perceptive guy. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, For being his first book as a longshoreman, it was pretty good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. No, he had a great way with, uh, great way with words. Yeah. Um, to kind of just bring it to like Eric Hoffer, where, where he you know, claims freedom is the rule, where equality is the, cr the cry of the masses. And uh, where equality is the rule, freedom is the cry of the few. In effect, if people find freedom in servitude, you know, kind of the idea that that I think F.A. Hayek played with. Do you think that uh, the reason we we have a cry for the equality is is really 
you know, as, as Hayek talked about that, that freedom, true freedom is responsibility and risk. It's not something, it's not the default condition of every human being to wants to be free. In fact, if you, especially if you look at, you know, the primitive version of, of people, they're also called children. Um, they actually find solace in, in being directed and being really, uh, you know, controlled until they, they feel comfortable enough to control their lives. I always kind of make the joke. It's like, you know, when you're a kid, it's like you, you look to an adult because you assume every adult knows what they're doing. Every adult uh, can, can find the right way, but then you grow up and you become an adult and you realize nobody knows what the heck they're doing. And it's a, a surprise. We don't get in a car crash every single time we start our automobile. Um, do you think that, that today we, we have people trying to escape that, that risk and responsibility by going to the, the freedom in servitude as opposed to making their own choices? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think all of that raises very interesting questions about uh, developmental psychology and developmental morality. And so a certain amount of it is going to turn on good developmental studies of children and how they, how they grow. Uh, this is not an area of expertise, although I, I've, I've read a lot and I've got some personal experience in, in this area. So if you take the two normative judgments that are, that are framing your, your discussion, uh, freedom and responsibility, and what then is your default attitude toward freedom and responsibility by the time, say, you are a young adult. And I think what we find is a huge bifurcation in contemporary culture. A lot of people love freedom and can't wait to be free, and they're fully uh, willing and able to take on the responsibility of, of adult living. I want to get my driver's license so that I can be free and powerful and go out there. I want to move out of my parents' house. I love my parents, but I want that freedom and I'm willing to pay the rent and, and commit to that myself. I want to go off to university. I want to start my, start my business. Now, my view is that's the normal, natural development for human beings. So what I think needs to be explained is why there are however many few people in the current young people demographic that have that attitude toward freedom and responsibility. So I think you are right. We do have a large number of people who don't want to be free. They want to be told, comforted. They want there to be pre-existing slots that I fit into where the thinking has been done, the expectations have been set, and I'm going to live according to those, uh, those rules. And so uh, I'm going to have a kind of nested freedom or a nested responsibility within a, a broader paternal, uh, hopefully a benevolent paternal framework, whatever, whatever that is. Now, uh, I want to leave it as an open question whether there are natural dispositional differences among infants. But my view is that uh, human beings come into the world and the natural thing for them is to want freedom and self-responsibility. So uh, right from the get-go, we start using our limbs and, and, and observing. So it comes from the child. You know, I want to learn how to talk. I want to learn how to move in the world. I want to explore and play with things. These aren't put onto the child as expect expectations. You need to learn how to talk. You need to learn how to walk. You need to learn how to, how to explore the world. When you uh, see uh, kids who are two, three, year, four years old working with uh, you know, interesting things to them that they have chosen, they typically take ownership of that thing. And uh, uh, it, it takes a lot for them to turn to an older brother or an older sister or their parents and say, I don't know how to do this. Will you tell me how to do this thing? In many cases, what I've seen is almost every kid uh, if you try to interrupt them and say, you're doing that thing wrong, here's how you do it the right way, they react negatively to that, right? They say, <laughs> back off, right? My, my two-year-old can verify everything. Okay, just okay, <laughs> good. Right, now, what I want to say is a lot of kids do that, and I want to say that's the normal thing. Well, if you have a kid who is five years old who doesn't know how to do anything, doesn't, isn't particularly curious about things. Anytime there's a new thing, automatically looks to the parents and says, what am I supposed to do? I think something has gone wrong with that child. So what I then want to say is that we start free. 
right? and, mm-hmm. and, and that freedom can naturally be encouraged. And we want to take responsibility. Uh, you know, if you think about kids and how delighted they are anytime they master some new skill, they're just, they're just so happy. So I, I did it myself and I did it well. And of course, they want to brag and, 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 and show off. Look, look at me, mommy. Look at me, daddy. Look at, and then there's siblings and friends and so forth. So that is, I did this and I am getting the reward for having persevered and figured out how to do it. And I'm becoming a more powerful, free and responsible agent. Now, I think that's the normal human, human development. So my question is, why do we not have a lot more geniuses creative uh, uh, innovators and entrepreneurs in the current generation, particularly when we have a society that is so rich, both in material goods and in, in opportunities. What needs to be explained is what has happened to so many kids such that by the time they are young adults, they are afraid of the world. Freedom sounds like uh, too much of an imposition. Responsibility uh, is not something they want to take on. They, they, they have various forms of escapist uh, uh, psychological releases. Yeah, there's, I didn't plan on going here, but I, I have, can I, I do have a theory about that. Can I, can I bounce okay. that off you about, um, so one, I think that we don't have rites of passage like we used to have. Um, mm-hmm. we used to have these, um, rites of passage, both for, for men and for women in terms of there was a clear distinction between you are no longer a ch- child you are now an adult Um, and being an adult comes with a very concrete set of responsibilities and being with uh, as a child is more defined by your lack of those responsibilities and maybe another set of responsibilities of preparation for transition to adulthood you know i see this in like one of the first places where i observe this is just to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole is i noticed that so my dad is is older he's in his like early to mid 70s and so my grandparents were like World War II generation. Like my dad is the same age as his, uh, his mother and father-in-law because he married someone a lot younger. But my point is I grew up around like kind of that World War II uh, era and, and then the baby boomers afterwards. So the idea so here would be you grew up fast, you went to war. That's a very clear rite of passage to take one. Example. Sure. And yeah. then look at how that gets changed as we lose those clear rites of passage. So the people who went off to world war one told those stories and then their kids heard them and they went off and fought in world war two. And then those kids went off and fought in Korea and in Vietnam. But then things start to change where like this going off to war thing and the war metaphor is super powerful. Hayek writes about that as well. The socialists use that, you know, to transition the actual war economy into metaphorical war economies it's a very powerful mm-hmm. metaphor because it resonates with us, on, I think, on a very deep level. But I've heard and I'm, I've observed this where people who grew up hearing actual war stories, they don't have those war stories. So they find analogs to try to map onto that. So they'll mm-hmm. tell stories about – so like my dad would tell stories about how he got drafted, but he only went to basic. He was never deployed. So all his stories to try and, you know, tie himself to his father's generation, my grandpa, his dad went off like after Pearl Harbor, he, he owned a tractor implement dealership in Southern Iowa and he didn't know how to swim. He went and took his wife and newborn. My uncle went to California, joined the Navy, mm-hmm. spent the entire war in the Pacific theater, right? My dad didn't have that, but he got to hear those stories. So he tells stories about going off to basic and I've heard other people his age tell stories about how like, well, they didn't go to basic, but they knew people that did. And there are people who are caught. And I think we see this. This is like one of my controversial like uh, takes, but I I don't think this is wrong. Is that every generation has to contend with and fill the shoes of the previous generation's war and rite of passage. And Mm. I think we do see this a lot in like the appeal of anti-racism you know, as it's put forth, because you have a lot of people today who had to hear the stories of the civil rights movement and the people who experienced real deal racism, real deal segregation, like evil acts, period, full stop. And there are people who are, you know, I think particularly in certain minority communities who are had to hear that. And it's like, this is heroic. You hear these Mm -hmm. people. And so it's like, what's my version of that? And so we're constantly trying to find these rites of passage. But I think on top of that, we have this lifestyle now. I think um, James Lindsay's made this observation that the 
that for a lot of people that grow up in the institutions, like, like higher ed, like K through 12 and just spend all their life there, that the institution becomes the central unit of society, not the family, mm -hmm. um, or like close networks of friends and relationships. And so if you think about like just the push for higher ed to be, so marry these two things, like the lack of rites of passage and clear distinctions from childhood into adulthood, you know, you can be on your kid, your parents' health insurance till you're 26 or whatever, all these kinds of things. You know, we actually make movies and joke about failure to launch with Matthew McConaughey, not, you know, the, the opposite, like you shouldn't be doing this, you know, even just think about the music, like the Beach Boys you know, wouldn't it be nice if we were older, you know, then we wouldn't have to wait so long. Contrast that with some of the pop punk anthems of the early 2000s. I don't want to grow up, right? Like, I don't want to be like you, you know, I want to stay a kid. Um, with the fact that people are largely institutionalized in a lot of these, especially like kind of metro metropolitan, um, upper to middle class settings, you go, you know, pre-K, K through 12, you know, you're in this, all of your life is planned out in a lot of ways and dictated by your parents. Uh, then you're, it's, it's just assumed that you're going to go to university and you're going to get a degree that they approve of and that their friends are going to approve of, you know, and so then you go there and everything's taken care of by, you know, the people in the university, yeah. they're coddled all through that process. Maybe they stay and then you're just in that for decades without ever entering the real world. You're in this yeah. milieu where it's like, we just, we decide these things with the collective of, you know, enlightened people and, you know, we, we don't have to take care of anything ourselves. You know, it's, it's all just kind of done yeah. for us or they go and they move out into an, well, the last part here real fast is then they go and move into an apartment or somewhere yeah. where they, if any, if something breaks down, they are not, they don't have to repair it. Their, you know, superintendent takes care of it. They take public transportation. So they're not responsible for a vehicle. They order out all their foods. So they don't learn how to cook. And so there's just this place where people never leave this, like, I, the place of being dependent on others for stuff to yeah. being like responsible for these things on their own, especially on into their like adult lives, because they're in a place yeah. where the food's all made for them. Everything's taken care of for them. They don't have any of that responsibility. So that's a huge deviation. You can, we can leave that or we can talk about it or we can go to the French revolution, but that's no, kind of, that is, uh, that is fascinating. That's, that's a rich set of psychological and, and sociological observations. And it kind of prompts two thoughts. I think, one is that we are in the midst and we have been in the midst of a reconceptualization of what it means to be a child and what it means to be an adult over the course of perhaps the modern world, but certainly the last hundred years or so, partly because we have become a lot freer. Uh, and so what does it mean to be a free adult? That's a new question for mm -hmm. human beings. And it might just be that it takes us a few generations actually to, to work that out. Also, we are so rich by, uh, by historical standards. So we don't have to, so to speak, cut childhood off so early and take on serious responsibility of, of making a living. And so what do we do with all of this wealth? And one of the ways we uh, uh, make decisions about what to do with all this wealth is by buying leisure time and extending childhood and so on. So what does it mean to be an adult in a free and rich society? What does it mean to be a child in a free and rich society? And I think we have good answers and, and bad answers to that. One thing I don't think is healthy is uh, I like <clears throat> very much, though, the idea that uh, we no longer feel that we have to define childhood against adulthood, that in some sense, being a child is being irresponsible and free and no pressures and you can do whatever you want, et cetera, et cetera. But adulthood is uh, very serious and nose to the grindstone and expectations of societies and, and bearing the weight of responsibility on your, on your shoulder. What we have much more prevalent in our culture is this idea of maintaining that child look or childhood outlook on the world mm -hmm. where you're, you're like a lifelong learner or a lifelong student or the idea that your work should be a kind of play, that rather than play being something that children do, but you stop playing and you become a worker, uh, or when, your work, uh, when, you, when you're a worker, you don't think of it as play, that instead our careers should be fun, playful, and that we should- Fulfilling. Way. That's right, that's mm -hmm. right. So that's partly to reconceptualize what it means to be an adult. What it means to be an adult is to maintain that same set of 
psychological outlooks. The world is open and sunny and full of opportunities to me. And it's a whole lot of fun, right? So I'm, I'm Steve Jobs and I'm 40 years old, but I'm, uh, you know, and I'm working at, at Apple, making all of these new toys and so on. But that's no different than Steve Jobs when I was four years old in a sandbox and the sand is just all of this potential and I can make whatever I want out of it. Mm. It's that continuity between childhood and adulthood. I think all of that is, is very healthy. At the same time, uh, there is a dysfunctional version of that. And I think that's what most of your comments speak to, that much of this, what you're calling institutionalization uh, and not having clear markers that you have mastered something and you are now more of an adult than you are a child, a lot of that has been abandoned, that either we're doing way too much helicoptering and, and insulating children from you know, the slings of arrows of, of, of fortune out there in the world, or we're doing too much uh, asking them to be passive, just putting them in an institution, uh, telling them to sit in straight rows and listen to the teacher for six hours and just do whatever's in the textbook, uh, instead of training them to be active and choosing their own Giving problems. them drugs to settle them down. That's right. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah the seven and 10 year olds who are, <laughs> I think, naturally supposed to be a whole lot more active. Yeah. We say, no, that's a problem. And so you drug them yeah. into submission. Right. So what you then are doing is actually anti-education. And so yeah. at that point, what you end up with is people who are biologically adults, but they still are psychologically in the uh, children in the in the lack of development sense. Uh, can that can is, I add something on to, to what you just said there? Yeah, like that part of that um, process of lay, of protecting them from things and laying everything out is a disconnect between freedom and um, and maybe I can thread the needle here to try to get us back on track. But a disconnect between freedom and success. Like people used to understand that their own freedom and agency was tied directly to their ability to succeed yes. in life. Yes. And okay. so whenever you aren't having to exercise your freedom and your choices to as and you see like a relationship between I do this, I plant this thing here, I go here, I cut down these trees to build this cabin so that yes. my family isn't destitute. That's so very well starving. said. Very Where well people said. nowadays like they like if you think of freedom as a currency, like it doesn't it seems like it doesn't purchase very much because they don't see a relationship between their own freedom and the outcomes in their life, because it's like, it's all planned out for me. I don't have to, you know, take risks or doing this stuff as, as Kevin mentioned. And so like, as that happens and people, my theory is that people are more willing to gamble with freedom and give it away because it doesn't seem like a valuable thing to them mm. because while the, the freedom being exercised by people that came before them is what built everything around them and allows them to prosper. They don't see a relationship between their own freedom and prosperity so they're like what's freedom anyway yeah. i don't care about this i can give that away for whatever and yeah. so that kind of goes to like the difference and even just so tell me if this threads a needle we can go either way you know rousseau's main comment at the beginning of the social contract um man is free but everywhere in chains right and so even rousseau understood that there was a connection between freedom and your ability to succeed, or there was something else there that, that went with freedom. But nowadays, people don't, don't have that. Maybe, again, that is the lack of distinction between adulthood and childhood, because one of those main distinctions is in childhood, you're not free, but you do have these responsibilities. When you're an adult, you do have freedom that you are obligated to leverage for like your own success and for the success yeah. of your family and, and your kin and so on and so forth. I don't know. There, there's kind of a lot there. but Yeah, you know there is I mean? a lot there. Uh well, I think it's, I, I would want to parcel it out a little bit, this connection between freedom, uh, exercising freedom, which is a form of taking responsibility and the outcomes of that, and being able to see all of the links in that causal chain, cause and effect leading to further effects and so on. I think it depends on what domain of human activity you're talking about. For most people, I think uh, economically, the point you're making makes sense. They don't understand how modern economies work. And so it's just a big magic box and stuff happens. And somehow <laughs> I end up with a certain amount of stuff and other people end up with a different amount of stuff. If you step away from business and economic issues and you start talking about people's love life and their sex life, then I think the connections between freedom and responsibility, pretty much everybody can grasp that and they do. 
Hmm. They don't want to give up their freedoms with respect to their sex lives. I mean, it might be you, know, you say you, know, you, you need to get a license uh, uh, to operate your business and to engage in international trade. And we're going to tax you depending on. And so you talk all of that in business. And say, yeah, yeah, sure. That's fine. But as soon as you turn that to uh, before you can have a date with anybody, you need to get a license. And that person needs to be approved <laughs> by the local government. And you need to have a, you know, a, a plan and show the, your environmental impact on depending on how many kids people are going to say, what are you talking about? This is my freedom. I'm going to make my own choices here. So uh, if you then were to talk about people's artistic lives, their religious lives and so on, I think the, the freedom responsibility is much more robust in that area. But for various reasons, economically, uh, uh, the disconnect is, is there. And I think you're, you're, you're right also to make a connection back to the left uh, in the following sense, this connection between freedom and responsibility, that people need to be free so that they can take ownership of their lives, including their productive lives to make stuff. And then your, your productivity is going to determine your consumption and profit is a measure of how productive you've been in a social context and so on. And so laying all of that out and making a case for a, an open market entrepreneurial society, the left is opposed to all of that, pretty much. And in both the Marxist version and in the Rousseauian version, as much as they disagree with each other, they don't like that heavy emphasis on individual freedom, agency, and, and, and responsibility for producing your way in the world. If you think of the ideal society, for the Marxist, you know, it is this projection of a place where, or, or a time in the future when all of the problems of production have been solved, right? We've invented all of the machines and the machines are just cranking out the products and, uh, and, and they're all just distributed uh, more or less equally to everybody. So everything that you need is provided for you by the state with its, uh, with its apparatus, but uh, underwritten by all of these high-tech machines. So that ideal is then to say, I don't really have to work. I can work if I want mm. to, and I could just work, you know, an hour here, an hour there. At home and write poetry. Just that, sorry? Yeah. You can just sit home and write poetry. That's right. Yeah. Or I can go fishing in the afternoon. So it's a very passive, uh, I don't need to work for a living and take charge of my living. And that's the ideal that is, that is being positioned. Mm. And then the same thing you find uh, if you go to Rousseau and Truman earlier is mentioning this this kind of speculative anthropology that Rousseau engaged in. So if we go back to the beginnings of time and the earliest uh, stages of human beings before everything went bad and it was all corrupted, and then he pr pr presents a picture of the way the world was, it was a simple, unspoiled nature and nature provided everything that human beings needed. If you needed to eat something, you know, you just reach up and grab a fruit from the tree and you eat it. If you needed to drink, you, there was a, you know, a nice clean stream nearby and then you could take a nap and once in a while have sex with you, with your partner, but there was no commitment there, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the economic problem is more or less solved. Nature is just providing whatever it is that you need and, and you don't have to work and so on. So I think that if that's your ideal, then that's going to militate from the get-go the idea that you need to take full responsibility for creating the economic value that you are going to, going to consume. And that's going to seem like an imposition of an unwanted kind of responsibility. That's inter it's, it's interrupting my freedom. I want to be a guy who just fishes and takes long naps, and you're telling me I have to work and be a responsible person. That's an alien philosophical, philosophical mindset. Now, there's a connection here uh, to religious conservatives, because I don't want to leave them off the hook on this one as well. So we might be beating up on various strands of the left, but you'll notice the description I just gave is very close to a kind of Garden of Eden portrayal. Right? So if you think of the kinds of works or the, the kinds of, uh, yeah, the, well, obviously the work <laughs> religious conservatives will appeal to, they'll go back to Genesis. And what they will say is, in the beginning, everything was good and perfect. And human beings were in the Garden of Eden. And God had provided everything that they did needed. They didn't have to work. Can I, I give you some pushback as a theology major on that? Well, just, uh, okay, I'm just going to push a story here. Okay. And then they committed the sin, right? 
And then uh, as a result of the sin, there were three punishments. One is mortality. There's pain in childbirth for women. But then God says, and now you are going to have to work for a living by the sweat of your brow. And you are kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Now, to the extent that you emphasize that theme, once again, taking responsibility for producing in the world, it's conceptualized as a punishment. And before you were free in the Garden of Eden and everything was provided for you. So the idea of uh, whether you're a religious conservative in that strong sense or a Rousseauian or a Marxist, you are conceptualizing work as an imposition on your freedom. It's mm. a responsibility that's a kind of punishment that you don't want. So yeah, push back all, all you want. All, all I'll say there is, and I feel bad, I just told Kevin I wasn't going to say anything else, but, I, <laughs> but um, is that the, the curse is that work was going to be difficult. Not that there would not that you were now going to have to work in in Genesis. God puts Adam to in the garden and Eve to work the garden. But the problem is that, is that now there's going to be thorns and thistles. So work instead of being something that is in, enjoyable that they're doing in you know in some type of communion with God, it's now going to suck. You know, mm -hmm. just like childbirth is now going to suck. Work is now going to suck. It's not that there wasn't going to be childbirth beforehand. It was just supposedly going to be an idealized version of it. So it's just a slight addendum. But my point is, my main pushback is there was work and it, and it doesn't necessarily conflict with what you're saying. It's mm. that work mm. was easy and now it's going to be hard and now it's going to suck. And now you should not look forward to it. Yeah. So it's so going it's, to be more of an imposition on your freedom yeah. and more of a burden of responsibility. So it's a matter of degree. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, actually, I, I thought it was interesting you brought up the religious conservative because I am a religious Christian who also happens to be conservative, but I, I think more on the C.S. Lewis light of I am not a, a Christian conservative because that means my conservatism is religious. I, I want mm. to disassociate those two. I'm a believer who also happens to be conservative. And I think the left is taking the other route where they are religiously, they might use liberal, obviously they're not using it correctly. I, I love F.A. Hayek's like the worst thing you guys possibly did in America is let them abuse the word liberal and redefine it to everything Absolutely. opposite of what it was. Absolutely. And and now the conservatives, Hey, over here, get to claim the title of the true liberal. Um, and, and, you know, there, there's that religious aspect of it. Um, um, yeah, but, but really. Yeah. And, and the, the point you're making is uh, Kevin is a good one. Cause that weirdness is a particularly a North American phenomenon, right? You go to Europe or South America or basically anywhere else in the world, liberal means liberal. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean fact. this this this, this <laughs> same strange big government welfare state organized people into tribes and, and and so forth that it means in the united states so yeah yes yeah. so we need to reclaim words right uh so to, to to circle all the way back around to like how we originally started this uh, going back to rousseau um, you know, I have a question here that involves the, the French Revolution versus the American Revolution, but I think uh, first we do need to tease out a little bit, and I know you go through it in your book, so if you just go through it quickly before I, I expand on the question is, what was Rousseau's influence on the French Revolution? Uh, yes, well, <clears throat> yeah, good question. Uh, French Revolution, as you know, is a huge sprawling topic. My reading of the French Revolution is that it went through three phases. And so uh, Rousseau was most influential on the third phase when things got terribly nasty, right? Madame Guillotine, the reign of terror, uh, and, and, and so forth. And so the reason for that is partly philosophical. Rousseau is a strong collectivist. When you are a strong collectivist, you don't see individuals. You dehumanize people, and you are willing then to do very nasty things to human beings if they aren't fitting into your ideological mission. And uh, the authoritarianism is baked into uh, Rousseau right from the beginning. So he's not in any sense a liberal. Uh, so by the time his disciples and Ro Robespierre, Marat, Saint-Just, uh, even Danton, uh, to a certain extent, they're all disciples of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And so I lay the primary responsibility for the real nastiness that the French Revolution devolved into uh, at, 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 at their doorstep and behind them. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, the French Revolution, though, initially started off, uh, you know, what's going on in France is all 
obviously a whole bunch of ideological stuff, a whole bunch of economic stuff, a whole bunch of political stuff, and so on. And there are lots of factions kicking around. You do have the monarchy, you've got the aristocracy, you've got people who are liberals in the American revolutionary sense of liberals. And this is partly why someone like Thomas Jefferson was so optimistic in the early days about the, the French Revolution. So he saw people like you know, Lafayette and Condorcet and, and others who were you know, followers of Voltaire, followers of John Locke and so forth. So they would be uh, American revolutionary liberals in the sense that we recognize. Uh, so you've got those factions, but then you also have the, the Rousseauians. So early on, what you have is a very weak monarchy under Louis XVI. Partly he's a weak monarchy because the monarchy has been in, in decline politically. Partly it's because he's a, a, a semi-enlightened guy. You know, he's, he's a nice guy. He's not a, a bastard, you know, dictatorial, in-your-face monarch. He wants to improve French society. He's open to reform. So he's, he's letting various cats out of the bag and so on. Also, the aristocrats who had been long a power base in French society, They'd been weakened under Louis XIII, Louis XIV, and so on, but they were getting their act together. And so you have the aristocrats, and it was primarily the aristocrats who are pushing and forcing what comes to be the first stage of the French Revolution. They see the monarchy is weak, the monarchy is open to reform, and so they're pushing for some political changes. Now, their motivation is not any sort of Lockean liberalism or Rousseauian egalitarianism. They want to get back some powers and rights that the, arist the aristocrats had lost over the course of the previous century and a half or so. So it's a, an aristocratic reform movement. That's the most important thing at that point. So they force the king to call the Estates General, which is a kind of uh, a Republican uh, parliamentary organization where all of the major elements of, uh, of French society are, are represented. Now that's the first phase. And so we're going to e exert some reforms and the aristocrats, the more liberal minded among them, and then also the people that we would say are basically Lockean type liberals are very influential at this point. And so if you read the Declaration of the Man of Rights and Citizens that was published early in the French Revolution, late in 1789, uh, as an American revolutionary, if you, if you read the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, you would say, hey, this is a good document. You know, I'm, I'm on board with probably 90% of, of all of this. And so that then is the second phase of the French Revolution that for the next couple of years is really dominated more by Lockean liberal types. Now, at this point, it becomes trench warfare in politics and various factions are, 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 uh, are fighting for each other. And it just happens to be the case that the, the, the Rousseauian egalitarians who are much more ruthless much more brutal and much more politically savvy at the time, they're able to wrest control and the, the movement uh, stops being a more Lockean liberal revolution, starts to become a more authoritarian type of revolution. Now, I think there are some other factors that are important. It's not only that it's, uh, it's Rousseau's ideology that comes to be dominant and the one that is most politically, politically savvy. Uh, France was uh, you know, an ancient society and there's a huge amount of uh, revenge psychology that just gets built hmm. up. So, uh, you know, the, the, the peasants really were maltreated for, for, for centuries. And people who are not in the, any of the upper classes were maltreated. So you have a huge portion of the population that just builds up. And then for the first time in history, they say, wow, maybe we're going to be freedom, may, uh, free individuals and get some rights. And, and maybe we can build a new society, but uh, for a vast majority of these people, these are not sophisticated people. They see instead a chance to take revenge and work out all of, in many cases, the justifiable resentments that they have, have, have been built up in them. And it's also the case that uh, the economically, France was suffering famines and certain kinds of dislocations in the 1780s. And those sorts of things bring out the worst in, in human beings. So it's a complicated story. And that's what I would, uh, would, would emphasize. But I think without Rousseau, the leadership of Robespierre 
and San Just and Marat. These are very smart guys, very well educated, trained as lawyers and, and journalists and so on. They, uh, without that ideology and a kind of a purist, uh, uh, we can transform society if only we are violent and bloodthirsty enough ideology, uh, it would have been much less nasty. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. When you explain that, it reminds me a lot of uh, Truman and I had to do some historical research on on uh, one of our road to serfdom, where, where we had to kind of research pre Germany. I didn't realize Germany was like a country founded like three weeks ago, relative in time. Really? Um, yeah. And and I didn't. We kind of understood the Prussian mindset, the war type mindset. Also, kind of, I think from a bit from Kant and Hegel, uh, is why you know, the series of events happened in the, the early 20th century. And, and it really helped us kind of understand, mm. you know, it's not, and I love the observation made by F.A. Hayek, that it is not a uniquely German thing, the thing that they did, but like, we can't just associate this just as, you know, uh, you know, they did back in the times of slavery where they just associated it inherently with some race. It's not inherently sure. them. It can happen to us. It's just, you need the right conditions uh, to be built before yeah, that happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, let me just say one more thing to contrast yeah. the, uh, the with the American Revolution. So the American mm -hmm. Revolution was largely ideologically driven, but you did not have any Rousseauian elements, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, in France. Mm -hmm. That was almost a purely Lockean liberal, to use a shorthand. And there was a much more ideological uniformity among uh, the general reading public and certainly among the among the intellectuals. You did not have that degree of ideological uniformity among the French intellectuals. Also, the United States was much less populated. It didn't have centuries of uh, grievances and resentments built up. Uh, and then you also had the sense of, uh, we can build a brand new country because obviously that's exactly what you're doing. And I think that's to a large extent, a different mindset from, we have this traditional uh, rooted uh, country and we're going to reform it uh, the idea of building a brand new country uh, is liberating instead of trying to overturn what you see as a corrupt society in order to maybe get a few reforms out of it. So the conditions are quite different. Yeah, um, I, I do have a follow up to that, but I just want to make sure, you know, we're coming up to an hour here. Uh, uh, you know, I, I certainly want to tie, uh, you know, my, my last question together. I, I know Truman wants to follow up. I, we have like a billion questions we'd love to ask you, but okay. maybe for another day. Uh, yes, so, so if you're okay sure. with going a little over an hour, uh, I let's hope that's go another right. 10 minutes. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, so, so we talk about the, the, the Rousseauian ideas that influenced the French Revolution, the, the liberal enlightenment ideas that influenced the American Revolution, the results of each revolution were obviously very different. And we can, I think, uh, confidently say that the, the liberal enlightenment ideas came out as a clear winner when you compare the outcomes. But we can't seem, even, even in the, the liberal West, cannot seem to escape the ideas of the French Revolution. What do you think is like attracting people in 2021 to the ideas that caused the reign of terror in the late 18th century? Are, are we just ignorant in terms of our education, not learning about this, not learning about it thoroughly enough to understand what happened? Or are we intentionally going down the same road, expecting different results? Mm. I think it's 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 both. Uh, I mean, history education is very weak in uh, contemporary American society. Uh, there, there are various reasons for that. Institutional, you know, the ninety percent of kids get educated in in public schools, and most of us have experienced that. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, for most kids, it's a uh, tune out as much as possible and uh, uh, just l learn whatever minimal amount you need to get through on the test. So motivationally, students are not excited about learning any history at all. So there is a huge amount of uh, uh, just ignorance of history uh, out there. And when people are ignorant of history, they're, they're not going to be aware of the bad experiments that have gone on and learn anything from those, from those bad experiments. They're also going to take whatever's good in their society for granted. They're not going to uh, understand the historical roots that had to be fought for, in many cases, hard fought for and won in order to maintain what they take for granted in their current society. So I think that's going to be one, one factor. Another hugely important factor, though, and I think the more important factor is ideological, that uh, there has been a long march through the institution of people who are not at all interested in advancing liberalism in the sense that we are using liberalism here, or any kind of healthy conservatism that 
the American tradition or broadly Western civilization or more even more broadly global civilization as we've been creating it for the last few hundred years, that we are we understand the institutions that have been created and why those institutions are, 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 are healthy and why they work and we want to conserve those for the next generation. We do have a large number of people who are ideological, who are in good position in important cultural institutions, including contemporary education, who are committed to very different uh, kind of anti-Western, anti-American, anti, in fact, civilizational values. That's what they are teaching as a, as a matter of course. And that uh, means a hollowing out of, uh, of the broader culture. Yeah, so last question. Um, it's kind of a two-parter. The first one, uh, part one is, do you see these institutions as they stand as salvageable obviously there is going to be some nuance some are going to appear more so than others but i think primarily of higher education you know and how like we we have a serious credentialing issue when it comes to higher education so you know it used to be if someone said you know so and so went to harvard you'd be like wow that's all you needed to know and you just assumed that they were competent and knowledgeable and going to be a productive member of society and now it's yes. what degree did they get um, because if they got a degree in medicine or something, and obviously there's now beginning to be asterisks there, but uh, you would say, okay, they're competent, productive, contributing society. But if they got a degree in like gender studies or something, it's, oh no, it's the opposite. You are actively working to destroy society right, as right. we know it. And so these institutions are, we have this credentialing issue where they are creating the pillars of society, people that feel like load-bearing institutions, like we need chemical engineers, right? Like we need astrophysicists, but those same institutions are also like creating and churning out the activists and ideologues that are destroying yeah. society. And so do you see them as salvageable? Um, if not, like how do you see the, like, I guess the, the, the purest form of my question is if we do b agree that we're in some kind of conflict here against an ideology that is totalizing. I think Peter Bogosian puts it perfectly when he says this is a universal solvent, this ideology. Uh, it does erode and destroy everything it interacts with. Uh, what does victory look like, whether it's in our institutions or in our society more broadly, like just a, as you see it? Again, I know there's a lot there, so you can go yeah. where, wherever you want. But So, yeah, as a broad, if we just confine ourselves to higher education as, as you framed it, uh, I, I think I would say two things in, in response. I think we we'll see in this generation a great sorting out of higher education institutions. I think uh, many of the higher education institutions that exist right now won't exist in 20 years. A lot of them will just go out of business. They won't mm -hmm. keep up with the, uh, with, with the technologies uh, uh, and or they will implode the way several colleges <laughs> have very publicly imploded and they will go, they will go out of existence. Uh, and, and then also to stay within the existing ones, if you mention something like Harvard, uh, Harvard will do an internal sorting out. Uh, the institutions like Harvard, they do reinvent themselves on a regular basis every couple of generations or so. Uh, they run a lot of experiments and that's what universities are supposed to be doing, running ideological experiments in many cases. A lot of times those experiments will be disasters, but Harvard has the resources and it will clean out. So. You know, if uh, you know, uh, you know, left-handed Wiccan studies department, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just to, to, to choose a particular ghetto, isn't pulling its weight, and it turns out to be an intellectual fraud. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, that we endowed it at a certain point, we're just going to get rid of that program. It might take five years, it might take ten years, right, and so on, but it will be, it will be gone. Students won't take those courses. The smart professors won't want to teach in those departments. Donors won't give money to it. The, uh, the administration at a certain point will, will get rid of it. And then the healthier parts of Harvard and other institutions, the medical school and so on, they will, I think they, they will be able to absorb the current assaults that are coming from critical feminist theory and critical race theory and so on. And uh, that's a crystal ball gazing, but they will, sure. they will take the challenge and they will make some modifications, but I think they will remain on a, on a healthy, on a healthy track. So uh, this would, this would be a prediction, but I do think we will see a huge reduction in the number 
of four-year and postgraduate institutions in the United States over the course of the next generation. The other thing I think is that we will see, uh, though we're into it, a, an impressive entrepreneurial phase and the idea that we can create brand new higher educational institutions is, a, 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 I think it's not only alive, but it's more alive now than at any point in American history. We have a huge amount of resources available for education and everybody recognizes the importance of education. Everybody recognizes that higher education right now is fighting for its life among a number, a number of fronts. And there's lots and lots of people who have lots of ideas about how to do higher education in a better way, and they're doing something about it. So one of the things that I'm encouraged by right now just is the fact that there are all kinds of uh, new higher education institutions being created, some of them online, some of them in person, and, and so on. So we will go through this great experimental phase, and of course, there's going to be a high rate of exper uh, entrepreneurial failure. That's also normal. But uh, I expect, you know, like, uh, you know, Google and Facebook and so on did not exist a generation ago, right, when I was a kid. And now they are dominating the landscape. Uh, you know, right now, say Harvard, MIT and Stanford are dominating the higher education landscape. But there's no guarantee that in 20 years ago, some new university that is just being created right now won't be the, uh, the, the 800 pound gorilla in the uh, higher education landscape. So I'm optimistic about that. I have some, some serious skepticism about some of the things you just said, but I, I hopefully we'll be able to talk to Truman. I'm so glad that we listened to someone uh, who is uh, optimistic. So that's good. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I think there is at least some discussion to be had about whether or not it's a good thing that Google and Facebook don't dominate the, the landscape. And the, certainly the Lindy principle favors more Harvard and, and Princeton sticking around into the future than it does some of those tech giants. Oh, but Yeah, I think they definitely will be around, right? but in the same way, the question is whether they'll be the same way that they'll be around that IBM and General Electric. Are right, still. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it, will they be around with the same, you know, clout right. and, right. and intellectual weight? Um, this has been great. I, I, I really have enjoyed this. Again, I like I'm just like writing stuff down. Like, gosh, dang, you're not going to get to that. We didn't get to well, the enlightenment. Uh, or, I think Kevin or, said earlier we will need to have another discussion. But let's absolutely, uh, yeah. Maybe we'll schedule yeah, ten more, and and we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. And we haven't even gotten to any of your expertise on COVID at the beginning, as as Kevin mentioned. <laughs> right. um, well, there you go. That's right. Yeah, I needed to solve all medical problems while I was here. Yeah, one, one, one. Uh, I don't one have insurance, man. Apocalyptic you're, you're... event at a time, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, let me get one, through the it? academic year, but maybe uh, May or June or sometime next summer, we can have another conversation. Awesome. Sure. Yeah. I mean, this, this has been great. Um, Kevin, why don't, you, why don't you take us out here? Unless there's yeah. any, anything else you'd like to add, doc, Dr. Hicks? No, I'll just let Kevin wrap it up. <laughs> can Perfect. you tell, actually, before he does, can you tell people where they can find you uh, and all of your material? And Yeah. And stuff? Um, I, I recommend two things. One is uh, we're doing a lot more uh, audio and video stuff at the CEE video channel at YouTube. So I would recommend that people go there. That's and where I got I, your book from. I, I totally listened to uh, your book on there. You know, that's uh -huh. fine. Yeah, just you do a great job reading it, by the way. Yeah, Not good, a lot of thanks. people yeah, do the, a good job the Nietzsche and the Nazi audio book just uh, went over two million listens, so we're we're very happy with that. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of educational products and intellectual products that we're trying to reach a mass market with. Uh, the other place I would say is just stephenhicks.org, uh, and that's where I blog and uh, where I. Pretty much everything also is is right there. Cool. So CE video channel and stephenhicks.org. Awesome, man. Uh, well, obviously, you can also find them on ThinkSpot. We just want to give a, a gracious thank you to the people at ThinkSpot. You know you are, uh, mm. who, who put us in contact with, with Stephen Hicks uh, and is doing a great job, at least in our own personal capacity with uh, me and Truman to kind of expand uh, who we get to talk to and, and you know, for people who are listening to this podcast who haven't listened uh, to Dr. Hicks, go to YouTube, consume the content, buy the books. Mm -hmm. he, he's so great at explaining the stuff. I was kind of intimidated when I first got explaining postmodernism to be like, this guy's going to go way over my head. I don't know. And, and just such a good job at breaking it down in, in, yep. in, a, in a way that the person who's not a philosopher, who's not a history major, can can digest it and understand it and and we can't thank you enough for for stopping by and uh yeah for all of you well, listening thanks, thanks for Super that uh, praise i appreciate it does yeah. my writer's ego good 
Good. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next time. All right. See thank ya. you. Peace. Bye.